Our next speaker is Dr. John Bender. Uh, John represents a, a large Colorado-based uh, multi-location, multi-physician organization that, is, that opened up uh, a DPC offering, I think about three years ago, where we, it was shortly thereafter the, right the DPC summit. Uh, so a very different perspective. Uh, you've, there's a lot of solo and small practice groups. Uh, John represents a segment. Two clicks. He needs two. That's powerful. Um, of how, how large groups, actually, who want, to, who want to move in the space, how do they think about it? And we want to share that perspective today. Awesome. Thanks, John. Well, Mike, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate that introduction. So, John Bender, family medicine physician, and um, uh, what an honor to be here to speak uh, to all of you today. When uh, Hint first asked me, of course, I was very excited, but for some reason, I didn't look at the uh, agenda until about five days ago, and I noticed that they had titled my speech, Sinking or Steering the Titanic. And I was wondering, is, is Mike, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> So I, I decided, well, I'm going to go with it. Um, I couldn't get a hold of Paul Lee, so I changed it. But I changed it a little bit to navigating the narrows, because I, I, we, we really don't want to sink the ship here. And, uh, and I decided, I'm, I'm going to go big or go home. So let's go with the bigger disaster, because the Titanic was not actually the largest ship ever to ship this was. Does anyone here know what that is? No, not the Killy Laurel. This is the Costa Concordia. Yes, 2012. Okay. What, was the, what was the captain doing right before it crashed? Wasn't drinking. That, that was the Exxon Valdez. He was showing off. He was showboating. Okay, so he was with the Mater D and a lady friend, not his wife, probably one of the problems. Uh, uh, and and they had a, the three of them had a fourth friend who lived up uh, on, on the coastline, and they said, maybe we can steer the boat in just a little bit closer and we'll give them a wave. Well, the nautical maps all had that territory charted as lots of big rocks. They hit one of those rocks, and the ship turned on its side. 32 people died, and it took two years before they could move it off. That's how long they had to build this big, huge, inflaty, floaty thing to flip it on its side cost 1.5 billion euros, or about 2 billion US, okay? What did the captain do wrong? <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you what he did wrong. He was focused on two or three people in front of him, and he forgot that he was in charge of a ship with 3,000 passengers and 1,000 crew members, 4,000 people total. Now see, I have an organization that my wife, Teresa, Teresa, can you raise your hand? My sweetie's here with me today. And I started with one employee and one computer, and we build up to 95 employees and about 25,000 patients. But the way I look at it is I've got a crew of my employees, you know, the 95 of them, and we're steering a ship that's taking care of 20,000 passengers. And I'm not going to do anything rash that's going to sink my ship, okay? That's the perspective I'm coming from. So I'm your captain today, and we're going to go through... Um, some discussions. So who, who am I really? Well, after I went to the Ways and Means Committee and told Pete Stark how it was, and he doesn't like physicians, by the way. Uh, I did get a chance to meet him when he was still alive. Uh, we started growing very quickly, became the fourth fastest growing company in Northern Colorado. We went from 160,000 in revenue our first year to 8 million in revenue. That's a 50-fold increase over about uh, 10 years. Uh, we won national awards for our IT implementation. We got patients that are back home of the year when that was a thing, and we were excited about that then. Um, I got into advocacy work, became president of the Carl Medical Society, representing 8,000 physicians in my state, got physician of the year. And so I had to decide now, what are we going to do next? Because I could see that the currents were changing and we were entering into the narrows. So I started getting into advocacy work. I wrote some bills that became law, dealing with immunizations, corporate practice, uh, medical marijuana. I would always go to the bill signing stand behind the governor. This one was on DPC, actually. Uh, uh, worked on telehealth. I got bored, so I started bringing my dog. And when I couldn't make the, uh, the bill signings anymore with the governor because I was just too darn busy, they would just take pictures and send it to me from my happy legislators. And why was I so busy? Because I was on the board of the American Academy of Family Physicians. What is the AAFP? Well, the AFP is the bold champion of family physicians. Uh, we have strategic priorities representing and advocating for healthcare. We do payment reform. 
which is really important because we get it that if there's not money to do uh, the things we want to do, we can't transform practices. We can't keep uh, medical students going into family medicine. It'll impact our workforce, and we won't have the clinical expertise we need uh, to take care of our, our patients and America's health. What is our membership? We're actually at 131,000. I don't have a slide for that, but that's the latest statistics released for 2018. 131,000 members nationally. And we're acutely painfully aware that family medicines, our uh, physicians and primary care in general, are, are not being paid enough to be able to, to sustain themselves. And so we've seen uh, lots of family physicians give up, quit, retire early, uh, sell out hospital systems, et cetera. So, the American Academy of Family Physicians just recently commissioned a study of our DPC membership. About 3% of our members are doing the DPC model out of those 131,000. And we sent out uh, surveys and had about 17% uh, response rate, which Press Ganey tells us that that's actually pretty good. So the 148 respondents, here's what we learned. 54% say they opened from scratch, which means 46%. Uh, started from an existing practice or other. That adds up to 100%. Uh, what else did we learn? 81% uh, opened independently. 68% had a business plan before they opened. That's probably a good idea. 58% uh, said, I had to still supplement my income and work somewhere, fill in the blank, urgent care or hospitalist or whatnot uh, while I was uh, opening. 55% had a marketing strategy. 43% worked with a consultant and 19% opened a practice with other physicians, they actually started as a group when they launched. The average time spent on planning, 11 and a half months. So these are moving pretty quick. What's the business model? Well, the study said 80% were pure DPC, 4% were hybrid, 1% concierge. I asked Bethany Burke, is Bethany in the room? I don't see Bethany from the academy. Okay, uh, somewhere over there, there she is. Hi, Bethany, okay. I said, these don't add up to 100%. She goes, that's right, because the hybrids were 14%. I go, oh, typo. Okay, so hybrids are actually 14% of the DPCs that are out there. Hybrid means that you're still living in fee-for-service and doing DPC at the same time. What is the uh, makeup as far as longevity? 11%. Uh, have been in business less than a year, 72% one to three years, and that's actually the, the cohort that I'm in. 10% uh, have been doing it four to seven years, and 8% have been at it eight plus years. And I think it's really important to note that 72% that or almost two thirds, or three fourths rather, are in that one to three year category. Because that means there's either a lot of high turnover, people opening them up and collapsing, or just a lot of people trying to rush into the space all of a sudden here in the last two to three years. There's a little bit of both. What are the membership fees? 9% charge less than $50. 65% uh, are doing 50 to 75, and about a quarter do more than $75. And there are also 13% um, that charge a per visit fee. So they're charging an additional day of service charge or something like that, in addition to the monthly subscription fee. 61% dispense medications, 57% participate in employer based contracts, 2% bill insurance to cover membership fees. The average target size, 596 patients, okay, about 600. But the actual average panel size is only 345 patients, meaning that only about 17%, when we looked at the data, actually have full panels. That means the other 80% are still accepting new patients. The average number of months to obtain a full panel was 20 months over a year and a half, almost two years. And I, I don't know that a lot of members at the academy realize that when they go into it, that it's gonna take me a year and a half to get there. Uh, sometimes there's some unrealistic expectations. Well, healthcare's not perfect. We owe the Chinese $19 trillion. Half of that's pensions, by the way. But the other half is healthcare waste. And if we can just reduce the waste in healthcare, there's enough left over for every man, woman, and child. And you and I know it. So here I am, I'm steering my big ship, I've got uh, my, my employees, and I got these take it or leave it contracts. So I said, well, I'm gonna leave, I'm not happy with that. So what do we do? Well, if, if you're in a bigger organization, and, and I'm not a huge organization, but I'm, I'm not a group of one, I have 14 providers and the employees, if I just flipped to DPC overnight, I would sink my ship. I mean, I just can't do that. We're gonna have to do some sort of organized, purposeful transition that's gonna keep everything in balance because at the end of the day, you know, I've gotta keep it all moving, right?
So the process takes time. We planned three to five years to do this, and it's painful. We did start having some staff reductions because over time we started realizing we don't need as much staff. I actually only have 80 employees now, and we actually closed a couple of our smaller locations that were really heavy on Medicaid and didn't have as high sales in the DPC space. Medicare, we stayed opted in. I'm in a state that has a, um, uh, a CPC plus or alternative payment model that's pretty lucrative. They're paying us an extra 600,000 a year. I don't want to cut that off. So our patients, when they're in the DPC program and they turn 64, we, we are from 64 to 65, we say, okay, we're going to disenroll you from our DPC and now we're going to take your Medicare. Why am I doing that? Because that's probably the, one of the last contracts I'm going to exit from. Medicaid, though, has been very toxic for us. Very, very hard. Hard on some of the others in this room that got entangled with uh, Medicaid and potentially was the result of their downfall. And it about killed me as well. We did great when Governor Hickenlooper in Colorado expanded Medicaid and they were paying parity, the so-called Medicaid bump. But when they gave us a 13% pay cut because gas and oil money ran out and they couldn't afford it anymore, I started losing about a quarter to $300,000 a year. That's not sustainable. We had to get out. And the reality is that public payers gravitate toward a takeover of the entire healthcare system. And they, they tend to create this insatiable demand that simultaneously drives out suppliers like me from the uh, marketplace because they control the price, they fix the price. And we're spending six cents on the dollar, 6% on primary care here in the US, while other nations are spending closer to 15% and have much better healthcare outcomes. Well, we have to get the amount of spend on primary care up quite a bit. And public payers don't generally control costs because they have a governance structure that's insulated from marketplace controls. And they tend to have political forces that don't allow them to reduce waste. Why? Because they want votes. And so as they try to get the votes, they're gonna keep giving more, more than they can really afford. So what are some other concepts for hybriding? Overhead expensive reductions are not realized as quickly as a fresh startup might. I mean, I still have a billing department. I still have to code. I still have to deal with EOBs because we have 20,000 fee-for-service patients. We've only got 1,000 DPC patients. And so my staff also have to be trained to think with two brains. We still have to ask everyone, do you have insurance and, and whatnot? And we have some strategies. Certain providers, like myself, are exclusive to DPC. If you want to see Bender, you have to sign up even if you have Blue Cross or Blue Shield. And patients who want to see me are willing to do that. So I think of it like we're in this big cocoon. We're not the butterfly yet, we're not the DPC I want to be, but we're also not the caterpillar anymore. We've decided we're, we're done with the yucky fee for service, but we're in this weird, highly metabolic activity zone that has a lot of brain damage and we're reprogramming our own genome and, and, and morphing into new features just as fast as we can, but it does take time. Uh, one last plug, the AFP DPC Summit is going to be July 13th through 15th. This is uh, being hosted by your friendly American Academy of Family Physicians in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. You will get up to 14 and three quarter uh, CME credits and we would love to see a high attendance. It's been very well attended uh, the past few years. So that's my talk and I have five, four, three, two, got that in under 10. That was 40 slides, by the way, one every 15 seconds.